All right. It is 10 after 1, so I'm going to get started as people trickle in. Then I will reiterate. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to turn my screen share on because I've prepared a couple of slides to start off with. But I'm Ryan Arnold. I'm the production coordinator at East Hampton Media. And what we're going to do today is talk about certain elements of story and editing and aesthetics for uh, a Halloween short film. So let's, uh, let's get started here. All right. All right, this is the event that you are attending, the Storytelling Workshop. It is Friday, October 9th. The reason that we are doing this is because East Hampton Media is putting on a Halloween video festival in the month of October. That means that we are going to be asking the people in our community to submit short uh, Halloween themed films. And at the end of the month, we're going to be displaying, exhibiting, and uh, uh, streaming on Facebook and on YouTube and broadcasting on our channel, the submitted videos. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to go over some of the basics of making a, a short video, making a, a digital story. A lot of the things that I am gonna go over today, a lot of the techniques have been culled from working in public access because there are a lot of situations where we are covering a event that doesn't necessarily have its own built-in action. I'm talking about a flower show or a, a bench rededication, something like that that people want a video commemorating where there's not a whole lot that you can actually show. So in that situation, I found that there are several tried and true go-to methods for creating movement and creating narrative where either there isn't any, or if there is, it's a good way to organize it. Things like uh, voiceover, music, sound effects, B-roll, titles, that's a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today. So I thought the easiest thing would be to go step-by-step step through my process of creating a Halloween-themed short video for the East Hampton Media Halloween Short Festival. Step one, is choosing an idea. You want to stick with as simple a concept as possible. You want to choose a story that you are familiar with and you want to choose something that you can approximate with the resources that you have. That is to say that if you have access to a car and an apartment, it might not be the best idea to set your story in space or to set it in a post-apocalyptic future where there is nothing but desert and charred uh, vegetation. You're gonna want to choose something that you have access to, choose something that approximates the amount of time and the amount of effort that you have to expend on it. Are you able to create effects? Are you able to go out and buy elements or costumes? Or do you wanna choose something that you already have? Also, I wanna mention at this point as you're trying to think of an idea that you might just wanna choose a story that you know and do like a twist on it. Something classic like Dracula or the Wolfman, the creature from the Black Lagoon, but put your own spin on it. So my choice was to do a parody of the 1986 film, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, except it's cereal with a C. It's breakfast cereal. It's a short, simple, easily translatable, even to the point of being ridiculous play on words that I don't have to do too much more with other than know that this is my idea, this is what I'm going to commit to. One of the reasons I chose it is because I knew I had access to interior kitchen and interior motor vehicle that I was able to approximate 
a set without having to spend too much money on extra amenities save for uh, a whole bunch of breakfast cereal. Now, after coming up with this concept, I thought, what does that even mean? A serial killer with a C. It could mean a guy who goes out and kills cereal, or it could mean a guy who kills other people but uses cereal. So step two is write a script. And what that really means is come up with a story. Even if you have a ridiculous concept, your story needs some, something to ground it to reality because the more ridiculous your concept, the more you need something to make the motivation or the conflict that you're trying to deliver believable. Believable is a relative term, obviously, but something that, that makes sense. Like for example, if your story was about a pumpkin that comes to life to take revenge on people who've carved jack-o'-lanterns, but his motivation doesn't make any sense, you know, you wanna treat that pumpkin as if he's a person so that people can relate to him. You might think, what does it matter if people are relating to my ridiculous character? It matters, even in the most ridiculous of circumstances, people are looking for something to engage with. And so for that, you need to have some kind of human motivation, I think. So for an example, I decided that in my Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer parody, that Henry was left alone by his mother as a young boy and had to fix himself cereal for many meals. Now he equates the brightly colored boxes, which he laments no longer containing prizes like they did in his youth, with disappointment and lies. That's kind of a stretch uh, based on serial killer, I guess, but it works. So what's actually gonna happen in the short film that I'm making? Because this backstory is not necessarily gonna be covered other than in dialogue. So Henry's gonna drive around buying lots of cereal, He's going to stop and offer a ride to a jogger who he tries to give cereal to, but ultimately kills. In the end, he builds a companion out of cereal boxes, who he then also kills. Step three, storyboards and shot list. If you've never seen storyboard before, it looks like a comic book that has uh, a key of your shots that you were attempting to get, the angles that you were hoping to capture. It is something that you can look at in order to make your shot list, which is the same in list form. Hopefully this will help you avoid unnecessary reshoots. It's just something that you can take with you so that you don't forget something that's important. It is a list that you would make of your shots. Okay, moving on. Before, I got started in the actual shooting. There were a few practical considerations to take into account. And I like to call these the twin demons of light and sound. They are the two most difficult things to fix if there is a problem with them in your shooting. So by that logic, they are the most important thing to attempt to get right. Light can be a problem in that it is inconsistent. I have had a couple of times where you don't take into consideration that there is a window in your shot and that it is going to look different depending on what type of the day you shoot. On the left is a shot of the first day that I was shooting. You can see the light coming in through the window even though the blinds are down. So what I ended up doing so that I wouldn't have to wait for the sun to go down before I could shoot for darkness is you can see in that still on the right, there is cardboard taped underneath the blinds blocking out the light to the kitchen. I ended up going with artificial light because it was something that I could control a lot more easily. It seems like a lot of times you can just go into a room and start shooting, but the continuity of the sun is something that has ruined more than a few uh, video shoots because people weren't paying enough attention to it. It's something that I guarantee if you get out of the way early, you won't have to think about it and you won't have to double back to fix it. The same is true for sound. I would usually recommend recording to either a, a digital recorder or even your phone 
hooked up to a halfway decent microphone can make a great double so that you're not relying on camera sound because one of the rules of video is that almost anything that can go wrong will go wrong and you should always have a backup plan always next i'm going to talk about props because that was my next step in this story that i created i purposely relied on things that I had handy. I used all of my own clothes. I used locations that I had access to. The only things that I brought in for this were fake blood uh, that I made with food coloring and corn syrup, as you can see. Uh, a fake skull. I assume it's a fake skull. It was from a, a uh, what do you call that? An anatomic model in a college classroom many years ago. And if it's a real skull, then uh, they've got some explaining to do, but it's not on me. And finally, probably the most elaborate thing that I put together for this was a uh, human form made out of cereal boxes uh, with a Fruit Loops torso and Captain Crunch arms. And I couldn't remember when I wrote this whether there were cereal boxes that had a big enough face that I could make a cereal box the head of a Frankenstein type monster. But lo and behold, they did, and I'm glad that it worked. What you see making the little smiley face there is a set of orange Christmas lights that are plugged in in the back. I thought that would look nice. It's very foreboding when the lights are off. In a situation like this, you have to make your own effects. You have to sort of paint your own picture and find what looks good. It takes a lot of trial and error, but in the end, I guarantee that it is well worth it. Okay, this part doesn't have a lot of fun pictures, but it is important. Shooting for editing. The reason that I mention this is because my background is more in editing than it is in shooting. So when I am shooting, or even when I'm writing, I'm always thinking about what I'm going to need for post-production. Editing is combining two or more elements and creating an overall effect. There are a lot of times where people come into the public access station and they say that they have one video of like a, a wedding or a concert or something like that and they want to edit it. When you have one piece of footage from one angle, all you can really do is fix the coloring a little bit and you can add titles. You're gonna need multiple pieces of footage and multiple elements before you can start stitching things together in an edit type way. So this is a short list, short I guess is relative, of rules that I've found for shooting that prevents extra work later. You wanna get different angles of the same subject. You wanna get reaction shots, you wanna use longer static tripod shots. This is important because the variety of a handheld shot can be really effective if you use it sparingly. But if you have nothing but handheld shots, you run the risk of seriously making people sick. Uh, if you want proof of this, then go no further than uh, any number of found footage movies like Cloverfield, like the Blair Witch Project, all filled with this shaky camcorder footage that was really striking at the time and is super easy to imitate, but does make you sick. So, oh, this scroller, I talked about props. Okay, although it sounds efficient to shoot only what you need, my advice is to shoot at least twice what you think you might possibly need. If you think you need 30 seconds of footage of a, you know, a, a butterfly or a, a car or something like that, then you need a minute. Almost every time you think you need 30 seconds, but you don't know which 30 seconds you're gonna need. So you need to shoot until you get that. Check your footage settings often. When you're starting out, you don't need to know what they all do. You just need to be able to identify which of them are ruining your shots and which are in danger of putting your whole thing at risk. So in the end, uh, as far as shooting for editing, cast a wide net, allow for happy accidents, and plan for unhappy accidents. This means that at least once, 
some great footage is going to get ruined by something stupid. Uh, I had a halfway decent take that I at least really liked the lighting of ruined because I had a microphone in the corner of the shot. I ended up cropping it, but it didn't look as good because you crop in on an image, there's like a little bit of distortion depending on how you originally filmed it. Okay. Movement equals progress. This is something that I'm gonna show in video form as well. But when you're shooting, before you start editing, something to keep in mind is that movement equals progress. Showing movement tricks a person into thinking that the story is moving forward. I want you to think about uh, medical dramas, courtroom dramas, uh, anything that's trying to, the West Wing, think about all the scenes of people frantically moving forward as they're talking, or even road trip movies. Think about uh, Thelma and Louise or Cheech and Chong, a movie with lots of movement that shows the story moving forward. This is like an optical illusion through editing. If you keep your camera moving or you keep your subject moving, people feel like the plot is advancing. So I took advantage of this in a couple of ways. You can see on the left is a freight elevator from the building that our office is located in. Not much is happening, I'm just standing there, but it is a cool shot and the movement sort of helps take you through it. On the right is, I did a lot of interior car stuff for this. Part of that was because it was uh, an element of the original movie. And part of it was that a car scene is something that is pretty nice looking and easy to get. You know, there are a number of cheap mounts. One thing I found through doing this is that Actually, the video camera on my phone uh, shook a lot less than the camera that I originally tried to mount in the car. So the, the shock absorber or whatever you call that is, uh, is, is, is pretty good. That's what I say. These are my suggested elements that I think you can add to just about any piece to make it pop more. Originally, I had come up with the idea for doing this workshop around documentary style, and all of these come from that. But I found that they all work just as well on a fictional short film, on a parody, in a commercial even. I don't think that there's any video project that you couldn't spruce up by putting these elements into it. Now the, the first element on here that I wanna talk about is B-roll. These are all screenshots from uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer with a C. <laughs> the main footage that I used in this was footage of me eating cereal. That was my original idea and I was like, I'll figure out the rest of this later and so I added uh, various b-roll to it of colorful cereal boxes. There's a number of stuff that I got in the grocery store. Empty bowls. You can see this bug over here which the bug is there because if you show two images then the mind will put those two images together. So I show this empty bowl and this bug right after each other and in your mind it's a cereal bowl with a bug in it which is incredibly gross and hopefully makes you feel a certain amount of aversion and repulsion because that was my goal. My advice would be to shoot as much b-roll as is possible that there is always something else that you can add to give your video texture. You know, this bug has absolutely nothing to do with my story. And to me, he is a star. I'm gonna end up showing some of my video clips at the end here, and I hope that you will agree with me on, on this bug business. All right. This is a supplemental device, this radio, and I wanna talk about happy accidents in relationship to it, as well as the freight elevator, honestly, because I, I did not think of using it until I was walking past it. but. 
I was driving home on uh, Sunday evening of last week, the day before I started shooting this, and I saw this old time radio in the side of the road. And it made me think of uh, MASH, the, the movie MASH, where the director, Robert Altman, shot like hundreds of hours of footage like a crazy amount of footage to the point where everybody was going to quit. And at the end of shooting, when editing started, it was just this incredible task of trying to put some of these scenes together in a way that made any sense at all. And so what they came up with was this transitional scene of the loudspeaker that would convey information that would be used to tie these scenes together. And that is the way that I chose to use this old time radio that information about what's going on can be added through this. And not only is it a break from the action that we are currently in, but it helps to convey a perspective outside of wherever you are. Night of the Living Dead is a movie that uses this device really, really well. There's a radio in the house that the people get trapped in, and it is the only way that you receive any information about what is going on in the real world and uh, what progress the zombie apocalypse is in. So I, I think that there are several ways that you can do this. Radio is a good one. Television is obviously a good one. You can record your own newscast and put that in as a way of telling people what's going on. This is a really old device. Uh, the first time that I can think of it or the most famous uses in Citizen Kane where the newspaper spins and then that's been redone by a million and a half movies since then. So uh, I, I, it must have a name other than supplemental device, but I thought it was too important not to touch on at all. And I could not find what the, what the name for it is. Also, this is considered a prop also, as well as the, the hammer. All right, before I start going into the videos, I want to talk about the importance of sound before I share what I ended up doing with it. Sound, especially when it comes to uh, Halloween themed videos is hugely important. The history of horror because of the way in the 50s that it was censored is inexplicably tied to the ability to make people think that they've seen something without actually showing it to them. And the number one way to do that besides cuts is audio. I guarantee that any horror movie, especially anything that has something really horrible, some kind of a gore effect is at least 50% sound that uh, if you look at Stanley Kubrick's movies, there's lots of dissonant sound. There's lots of sound effects that echo. And that's what I tried to do for my short film, which ended up being more in the style of a, a trailer than a full on film because I used music throughout. There's about three or four different pieces of music that get faster and more dissonant and more difficult to, uh, to, to hear at any rate. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henry. What's your favorite kind of cereal? I like the really sweet, sugar-coated kind in a bright, colorful box. Some smiling cartoon characters staring at me, reassuring me that things are going to be all right. When I was a boy, my mom wasn't home very much, so I had to make a lot of my own meals. I wasn't allowed to use the stove, so 90% of my meals were bowls of cereal. Boxes of cereal used to have prizes inside. Not anymore. Now, they're empty. Just like people. The 
colorful and sweet. But really, they're just full of sugary cardboard garbage. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? WOULD YOU?! In other news, police are still seeking information about the whereabouts of a 26-year-old woman last seen jogging near Route 9 late Saturday night. Any information should be sent directly to the police. They're gonna catch you, Henry. They're gonna catch you and they're gonna see what you've done. And you're almost... So, uh, one thing that I want you to notice about that is that it is super filled with sound effects. Uh, I feel like one of the great things that sound effects can do is it can really heighten the, uh, the dissonance of things. I don't know if you could particularly hear the, the sound of that freight elevator, the gate on it, sort of echoing down the hall like a... Uh, like a drawbridge, like a like a dungeon door or something. So it, as opposed to just using it to convey that something is happening, I mean, I used some sound effects, uh, some impact sound effects, some drums, some things to convey not just mood, but how, I don't know if you could tell that the music itself is getting faster and faster. I'm adding instruments, I'm adding drums uh, as it goes on in order to, drive at home and in the moments that it takes a break and stops the music I'm filling that with uh, sound effects on the on the ground level now I'm gonna screen share one more time and just show you the physical structure of uh, what that timeline looks like and back. what's your favorite kind of cereal I like the really sweet sugar. At this point, I intentionally stick in this dark moving footage, not only because it's moving, which sort of picks up a momentum, but also because it's foreboding. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. You just see movement, you see darkness. You're not sure if this is supposed to be the point of view of a killer, the point of view of a victim. It could just be somebody walking by, seeing something that happens, and this is the kind of thing that, that draws you in. Kind of this shot is so colorful. It is the main reason that I thought of to use tricks, because 
it is a really stark juxtaposition to the darkness of the previous shot, but it also weirdly matches the bright red color of the elevator. So as I go through, I think that the uh, that that elevator shot lasts a full like 44 seconds, and in between, I'm able to put in a uh, video of me driving around at night, video of the serial, and video of the the dimly lit side street. As we feel the movement and we keep going, I start showing. The distortion on this shot is supposed to mirror the mental state of the character that I'm showing. This is something that is implied, and I don't know if it is as translated as I would like to think. But uh, also these point of view shots. This camera didn't turn out as well as I would have liked, but this is a good example of what I was saying about shooting lots and lots of B-roll because a shot like this, I couldn't use as my main shot, but as a blink into just sort of illustrate the anxiety of waiting in line at the grocery store, I think that it, that it works quite well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead to this transition where I move from our original shot of the dimly lit side street, we see the car go by. This is not my car, uh, it's just a car that went by, but I decided to use it as a transition so that when you switch to a point of view shot, it looks like that's absolutely the same car connecting that first shot of the dimly lit side street to the shot now where we see the jogger. So a lot of it is about connecting the dots and sometimes it's not apparent right away. And that's where we sit down and we think, what is the situation in which this makes sense? And how do I use what I know about human motivation to make it make sense? All right. So I'm gonna play it from the, from the video drop again. Again, this is something that you're implied seeing. You see, car going down the road, you see a jogger Colorful. on the side, you see it Sweet. start to slow down, and it cuts Sweet. straight to the car Cold. being pulled over, Shipping and then darkness. Cardboard garbage. Colorful. Some cereal. What are you doing? Stop. Here we have my, my one uh, special effect, which was that I tried to use uh, this, this stabbing sound effect. She was so determined to not have to do that more than once, but she was laughing so hard. <laughs> so again, I think that this is something that can be completely implied, and I don't know that it's my finest moment, but it's probably the first time that I've tried. So I think it's clear what's trying to go on. There's a reason that I didn't make it the centerpiece of this video. <laughs> And from this point on, it's pretty much montage and it's working with sound. It is, uh, the, the music is getting faster. I'm adding more and more and it is all hopefully bringing it to a pace where you're like, what's going on? It's supposed to be a frenzy. And at its best, sound helps you figure out what kind of mood you're supposed to be in. You know, it can be relaxing, it can be tense, it can be, scary and generally you can find pieces of music that will suit any video need that you have just by going online and looking for royalty free music. I believe that most of the middle part of this video is being mixed with a track that is called Horror Chase. So it gets very specific regardless of what genre you are looking for. All right, I'm ripping up some cereal. This is, I, I would even go so far as to call this an effect because it is effective. It's cheap, but it's very pleasant to watch. That's the kind of thing that you can always depend on a handful of things looking nice on screen. 
and they are uh, really any kind of vapor, fog, steam, smoke, and anything like that, and breaking stuff. Uh, you don't wanna be doing it all the time, but honestly, if you can have one heightened breaking stuff scene, even if it's a bag full of cereal, then it's going to, I mean, when you watch that, you do get the satisfaction of feeling like you stabbed that bag full of cereal, which I don't know if that's something you're into, but I, I think it would look nice. All right, now my other special effect is, is coming up here. Now, I would like to state that this is both very, very silly and a little bit terrifying, which is exactly the line that I want us to straddle because both of those are acceptable reactions. <laughs> the line between ridiculous and funny and downright horrifying is pretty thin. And if you occasionally cross it, then, you know, it's a, the time of the season, I guess. But I didn't exactly know what I was gonna do. I'd written on my shot list that I was going to construct a person made out of cereal boxes. And that is as far as I got originally. I had planned on putting a bladder filled with fake blood, like a plastic bag behind one of the cereal boxes, stabbing it and then having it bleed. But that turned out to be more difficult than I first thought. So I ended up just saying to myself, it's full of cereal, that's gonna look good. Like Would these scenes have looked boring without all these insert shots? Yes. Yes, they would. They would look boring and silly without the insert shots, without the music telling you at what pace you should be watching this, without uh, the extra sound effects. What I'm doing is patently ridiculous, but the reason why it's working is because it is being consistently propelled along by the sound and by the video editing. So in the end, I am taking a ridiculous idea that maybe doesn't have the strongest legs and I am fleshing it out by using the strategies that I spoke about earlier. I'm using lots of sound effects. I'm using music, uh, multiple pieces of music to directly impact at which point you're feeling what thing in the trailer. I'm using voiceover to tell you what the motivation of this character is because certainly I could do this without giving you any information about him because it is a ridiculous joke. But I would like to think that something about making the ridiculous character more human makes it a little bit unsettling, even if it's still mostly just funny. I don't know about this fake blood here. I think I, I may, might have under, underdone it, but that's okay. Got a horrifying tableau here. And then brings us to the radio. Again, there are a bunch of versions of this trick that you can do, and it works not just with fiction, but with documentary. If you get a, a news uh, story, you can get a, a microfilm, you can get a, a photograph, anything like that really helps flesh out a story. The, it, what it comes down to is that the thing that makes us identify with a story, the thing that makes us engage is when we see things that we recognize and empathize with and identify with. And so the reason I picked a really ridiculous concept was I wanted to see if I could make it work semi-seriously. And I don't know if I was completely successful, but I certainly don't think that it was a total failure. <laughs> I think that trying to make it more believable and more human where I could worked to the effect that I think it turned out engaging. I'm not finished with it yet. I have, uh, I will be working on it between now and the time that these videos are going to be displayed. But 
I wanted to go all the way through the process because this is a number of things that I've been working on for a, a long time as far as the, the workshop and some of what I had to say about the benefits of sound and editing and visualization and all of that. So. Thank you very much for, for, for joining me. And I hope that I will be speaking with more people later on in the, in the month about submitting more videos, any kinds of questions, any kind of advice that, that I could give, that is what we're here for. Ryan, I do have one question about your lighting. Yes. Um, this is Glyphy. So did you um, use different lighting in the scene where you, where the, the um, lady is? Um, as opposed to when you were eating the cereal on the, and uh, it showed on the floor? Uh, nope, those, those were, I had uh, two, two of our studio lights and I'd blocked out all the, all the uh, natural sunlight in the room with, with either shade. Like with the cardboard? Oh, I see, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for attending, I appreciate it. <laughs>